Chapter 18 Paranoia They continued through the canyon on donkeys. X, fortuitously, had learned to ride while impersonating a polo-playing Andover graduate for a scam. He'd taken riding lessons in New York's Van Cortlandt Park, not quite the stable of Arabian stallions he'd told a sar about in prison, but good enough that he was at no risk of tumbling off. Hooves echoed between the rocks around them as they made their way through the pass in single file. Asar was right. It would have been difficult to negotiate the narrowing ravine in the truck. "'How much farther?' Harry asked. "'Half a day's ride. No more,' said the teen. "'We are home free.' A voice came over a bullhorn, echoing through the canyon a half-dozen times. "'Stop! Put up your hands!' This is getting old, X thought, sighing. The identity thief looked up. Guns were trained down on them from atop the ridges on either side. About fourteen men. They wore the uniform of the ISI, the notoriously corrupt and brutal Pakistani security force. Well, I suppose the good news is we've crossed over into Pakistan, he thought. Asar began to go for his rifle but X grabbed his arm. "'There are too many of them, my young friend,' he warned the teen. "'I am not afraid.' X shook his head. "'Bravery without wisdom is not bravery.' The travelers tossed their rifles to the ground and held up their hands. A moment later, several of the Pakistanis had scrambled down the slopes and surrounded them. A few remained atop the ridge, still training their weapons at them with sweaty fingers on triggers. They seemed rather jittery to X, and it was easy to imagine one of the barely legal young soldiers firing by accident. Harry told the ISI troopers they were merchants returning from Afghanistan, having sold their wares, and once again the cover story fell flat. The officer in charge, who identified himself as Captain Hespani, raised his eyebrows with skepticism and ordered them searched. The Pakistani troopers didn't make the same mistake as the bandits. As well as frisking the men, they brusquely searched Tracy. She protested, to no avail, when Captain Hespani personally slid his hand between her thighs. "'Aha!' he exclaimed as he produced the little handgun. "'Is this for hunting mountain goats?' "'We are with the warriors of Allah,' Asar volunteered, proudly puffing up his chest. Our weapons are for fighting the enemies of Islam. Captain Hesbani expectorated noisily. My brother was murdered by you fanatics, the officer informed them. He turned to his men. Chain up these pieces of crap and take them down the road to the trucks. His men jumped to obey. Wait, we're American intelligence officers, X said in perfect English. Tracy turned to him. Shut up! I'm going to personally kill you. Harry exclaimed. It's the only way, Tracy, X said. She gasped at his use of her name. Captain Hesbani raised his eyebrows. I suppose you have identification papers to prove this? Don't be ridiculous. Suppose we were searched, X explained. Tracy spoke in Urdu, the national language of Pakistan. Don't listen to him. He's gone mad from a fever. Tracy, talk in English, X said. The game's over. He winked at her. Tracy hesitated. They had nothing to lose at this point. The rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain, she said in an exasperated voice. That was very good, said Captain Hispani. It might have fooled another man, but I happened to watch a good number of American DVDs, and I can tell you your very well-practiced American accents are phony. That is the worst American accent I have ever heard, an underling concurred. Another piped up. Mine is better than that. Listen, are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Well, then, who are you talking to? Another contributed a freakishly high-pitched impression of Chris Tucker in Rush Hour. Can you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? That's more than enough, Captain Hesbani said, warily running his hand through his hair. Wait a minute, said X, stepping forward. Let me speak to you alone for a minute. 
Captain Esbani frowned, then gestured for his men to keep a close eye on the others. He walked with X a few yards from the soldiers, till the two were just out of earshot. Okay, you have outwitted us, X said. We are not CIA. We are with the Jihadist Brotherhood and the Warriors of Allah, which, as you must know, are in close alliance. If you let us go free, we have a little gift for you. Gone. Over that hill, in a cave about two kilometers away, we've stashed five kilos of opium, enough to get a few platoons high, worth more than five hundred thousand dollars. Captain Hisbani frowned dubiously. It was well known that the insurgents trafficked in opium to finance their operations, while vehemently condemning the use of drugs and alcohol as an offense to Allah. Take me there. Promise you'll set us free, all of us. Done. Let's go. Let my friends go first. Captain Hispani laughed. I don't think so. First the drugs. If I'm lying, you can shoot me. What makes you think that I won't shoot you when I have the drugs? You have an honest face. Captain Hispani smirked, and they returned to the group. He announced that the others would be allowed to ride off on their donkeys, but X would remain. We're not leaving without him, Asar protested. Shut up and get lost before I change my mind and have you shot. Harry whispered something in the teen's ear that convinced him it would be all right. X watched as the others, who'd been given back their weapons, mounted the donkeys. The captain gave Tracy's horse a slap on the rump that conveyed an admixture of lechery and contempt. The two men watched as the animals trotted down the road, past the ISI troops. X didn't trust the Pakistani officer as far as he could throw him. It was certainly possible he'd order his men to track his companions down, and round them up in a few moments. All he could hope for was to give the others a decent head start. Captain Hisbani told his men to stay put. Then he ordered X into the back of the jeep, nestled around the bend. A driver hopped in, and they drove in the direction from which the travelers had come. So this is how the chief and his cronies fund their glorious jihad. Selling opium, eh? The Pakistani officer snickered. This man of God is a filthy drug dealer. Be careful how you speak of the chief, X warned. I'll be careful of nothing, Mr. Nobody and Mr. Everybody, said the captain. In ten minutes' time they had reached the bandit's cave. X and Captain Hispani climbed the steep slope, leaving the driver in the jeep. X got to the opening first and reached to help the Pakistani up. They descended into the cavern. A bit spartan, Captain Hispani remarked with a sneer at the sight of the cots and makeshift furniture. Egg crates served as chairs, a rickety wooden bookshelf did double duty as a pantry and grenade rack. Creature comforts mean little to me now, said X. I've found a cause to live for. You should do the same. The officer grinned unpleasantly. When you have a gun, I'll take advice from you. He gestured toward the crates with a pistol. Where are the drugs? X knelt before one of the crates and, with some effort, pried it open. Captain Hisbani looked at the stash, his black eyes glistening like pearls. I did not believe you, he said, marveling, as he held up a bag of opium. You should have greater faith in your fellow man, replied X. I must thank you for making me a very rich man, Captain Hisbani pointed the pistol at the American's head. Since I know you are a religious man, I will let you say a prayer. You have one minute. You promised you would let me live. Your minute is flying by. X dropped to his knees and feverishly began to utter a Muslim prayer. The scam artist had memorized a stalling verse for just such an eventuality, the longest he could find in the Quran. While he rambled on, the Pakistani lit a cigarette and stood calmly savoring it by the cave entrance. I've always wanted to retire to Venice, the officer said, his eyes growing misty, to see all that magnificent artwork. I studied to be a painter, you know, but my father insisted that I drop out and take a real job in his brother's factory. 
It is only by accident that I found myself in the military. When X finished the first prayer, he segued quickly to another, continuing to improvise and embellish as long as he could. And may Allah watch over my children, and my mother, and my nieces, and my nephews. Captain Hisbani had finished his cigarette and emerged from his reverie. Wrap it up, the officer said. He ground the cigarette into the dirt with the heel of his boot. I am not finished, Ekt protested. In fact, you are, said the Pakistani. Wait, wait, Ekt said. He stumbled to his feet. I really am an American. Not CIA, DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, working undercover. My name is Jeremy Blinkoff. It really doesn't matter to me if you are an American secret agent, a drug smuggler, a jihadist warrior, or the King of Siam, Captain Hisbani said. You have given me what I want, and you have nothing to bargain with. He pointed the gun at X's left eye. That's where you're mistaken, my friend, X pressed on. There's more, much more opium than this nearby. Five Jaffa points along a trail, extending from here to Kabul. We're talking in the neighborhood of fifteen million dollars. I can take you to them one by one. Captain Hisbani shook his head. Tut, tut, tut. You should have let your last words been a prayer, not a lie. X closed his eyes, and a deafening gunshot echoed off the walls. When he opened his eyes, he was relieved to find himself alive, and the Pakistani officer lying dead on the cavern floor. A bullet hole bisected his brow. Harry stepped into the light, a wisp of smoke trailing from the forty-five in his hand. "'I didn't know you cared,' X said. "'Don't get any ideas,' said Harry. "'You're key to this mission.' "'How did you get back here?' Harry pointed up. I came on horseback along the ridge. The others are waiting for us up ahead. What about the driver? I've already taken care of him. Well, I owe you one, sport. Whatever. I'm sure you wouldn't have pulled that stunt if you weren't pretty sure I'd come for you. Let's get out of here before those goons come looking for their commanding officer. X stepped over Captain Hispani's body and headed to the cave entrance. Looks like you'll never see Venice, he thought. Back on the donkeys, the party continued down the canyon. Asar, riding beside X, remarked, For what is worth, I think your American accent was very good. It was worth a try. X punched him in the shoulder with good humor. It is no compliment to say I have mastered the great Satan's tongue, he said. Let us pray that the day will come soon when English is no longer spoken in the Persian Gulf. By late morning they had emerged from the canyon, and vistas beyond the walls and the pass soon came into view. Snow-capped peaks soared beyond rolling hills. Below the trail there was a narrow strip of green surrounding a river that meandered through the rocks into a sprawling valley. The rich green stood in stark contrast to the shades of brown they had left behind. In the middle of the valley stood a small town. The town of Jafuzi, Asar told the others. The people here are friends of the cause. They rode down the winding path toward the village. As they approached the town, they saw young men on horseback playing Puskashi, a popular game among tribes on both sides of the border. Similar to polo, it's played by horsemen, each trying to grab a goat carcass and use it to score a goal. When the men saw the four strangers approach, they continued to play but one veered off and raced toward the village. He returned a moment later with a man who was, presumably, a village elder. The somber-looking fellow wore a black turban adorned with gold. When he recognized the Tsar, a broad smile spread across his face. The two men dismounted and embraced. "'Young warrior, I did not think I would ever see your face again,' the elders said. "'It is good to see you again, noble Fawad.' the teen replied. I will never forget that it was you who recruited me into the jihad. Asar introduced the others, paying special attention to X. Fawad, this is the man responsible for my escape, with the help of Allah, Ali Nazir. 
The tribal chief shook Ali's hand vigorously. I've heard all about you, he said. The CIA tried to suppress news of your escape, how you made fools of the Americans. But it is all over, Al Jazeera. X bowed humbly. It is you who fight unobserved for the engine of the jihad, he said. False humility seemed to work wonders with these folks. Fawad beamed with pride. Come, follow me to my house, he said. You will be my personal guest tonight. Though the exterior was as humble as all the rest in the village, Fawad's house was well appointed. Vases lined the shelves, oriental rugs that would go for ten thousand bucks in the U.S. adorned the floors. There was, much to X's delight, even a toilet, albeit in another small building apart from the main dwelling. They sat around a table, dining on traditional foods. On the menu was paloa, a rice dish given a rich brown color by caramelized sugar, nandru, an onion-based stew with yogurt, dolma, stuffed grape leaves, and londi, a kind of spiced jerky. X had difficulty stomaching the londi, and barely managed to avoid puking, but dutifully complimented Fawad's wife. Tracy eagerly asked for recipes, and the burka-shrouded woman was clearly ecstatic about the attention. The discussion turned from food to politics, a topic X would have preferred to avoid. Mr. Jones had briefed him on the intricate relationships between the governments of Pakistan and Afghanistan, and he pretended to listen, but those kinds of details always bored him. He had consistently received C's in social studies in high school. Farwad was intrigued by Ali Nazir's background of wealth and privilege. "'Your family is so close to the royal family of Kuwait,' he observed. "'Do they approve of your involvement in the Brotherhood?' X shook his head. He did recall that Mr. Jones had briefed him on the bitter feud between the real Nazir and his relatives. "'They have pressured me to cease my efforts.' explained. Their companies did a lot of business with the royal family, but because of my activities the king has cut them off. They sent me my uncles, my nieces, even my mother, a dozen times, asking me to stop and return to Kuwait and make an agreement that would keep me a free man. You could be living like a king, Farward marveled, enjoying fast cars, yachts, all the trappings of wealth. Instead, you choose to fight alongside us in these mountains, like bin Laden himself. You are truly like a martyr of old. Hopefully not a martyr any time soon, X joked. His host laughed. Agreed. Then, more solemnly, X went on. How can I enjoy luxuries when my brothers are oppressed by the Americans, the Zionists, and their lapdogs? Harry stood up. Speaking of luxuries, I think I will take advantage of the modern plumbing. Slinging the knapsack bearing his laptop over his shoulder, he slipped out of the room. They continued talking about politics for a moment, Fawad railing about the latest outrages of the Israelis in what he called Occupied Palestine. After enduring the tirade for a few moments, X excused himself, quietly beckoning Tracy to follow him. X reached the little building that housed the toilet, looked around to make sure no villagers were watching, then grabbed the door and wrenched it open. Harry sat on the john, his trousers around his ankles and his laptop on his knees. He looked up in shock at X. "'What's wrong with you?' he demanded, falling into English. "'Can't you see I'm taking a dump?' X grabbed his feet and dragged him off the commode. "'What the fuck? Are you insane?' Harry shouted. When he saw Tracy standing there, he tried to cover his privates with one hand, while clutching the laptop with the other. Can't a man have some privacy when he searches for porn? X yanked the laptop from him. Nice try, Harry, but you're not a hard enough man to pull that one off. He handed the laptop to Tracy and pointed to an outgoing email. She couldn't make out the words, which appeared to be in code, but the names of the villages they'd passed through were there, along with a map. He's been updating them on our location every step of the way, X said triumphantly. Tracy stood back and stared, stunned at Harry, who was hastily pulling up his pants. 
Christ, she gasped. He's a triple agent. That's ridiculous, Harry sputtered. A triple agent? Why not a quadruple agent? That would make me back on your side, wouldn't it? Honestly, you're being paranoid. Paranoid? Tracy shot back. There's an agency so secret the president doesn't even know about it, and we're working for it. At least, I'm working for it. So paranoid makes a whole lot of sense right about now. I've had enough of this, Harry said. He reached for the laptop and tried to touch the power button. Touch that computer, and I'll put a bullet through your brain, Tracy said, pulling her beretta and pointing at him. Keep your hands where I can see them. For God's sake, woman, they could come around that corner any minute, Harry said, holding out his hands, palm up, and to his sides. Stop pointing that thing at me. He added, I know an FBI agent isn't going to shoot me in the head. She lowered the gun. A bullet in your testicles, then. Let me see the screen, said X. She passed him the laptop. All that super patriotic BS, Tracy muttered, shaking her head in disbelief. What are you talking about? Harry asked, doing his best to look bewildered. X began to laugh, till tears ran down his cheeks. Let us all in on the joke, Tracy said, her weapon pointing on waveringly at Harry. Those are Hebrew words, X said. Holy smokes, you're Mossad. That's nonsense. Now I insist, Harry began. Tracy cut him off. You're in no position to insist on anything. This is crazy, Harry whined. When Mr. Jones hears about... Oh, knock it off. You busted, X said. Do you want us to be at this all night? Harry sighed. Yes, of course I'm Israeli intelligence. Well, shalom, said X, bowing. Tracy returned her weapon to her holster, flashing a generous helping of brown thigh in the process. Jones said you were recruited by the CIA in high school, she said, shaking her head in bewilderment. I'm second generation, Harry explained. Israel recruited my parents in college. They changed their background from Jewish to Lebanese Christian back in the 70s. Tracy was dumbfounded. I knew the Russians did that kind of thing, but the Israelis? I knew something wasn't kosher about this guy, said X, so to speak. What's your mission? Tracy demanded, simply to observe and report. I vote we plug him now, X said. This isn't a democracy, Tracy snapped. Can we talk alone? Harry said to Tracy. Without this idiot, he can't be trusted. Oh, you're funny, Tracy said bitterly. Give me one reason why I shouldn't waste you right now. I'll give you two. Number one, you need me to complete the mission, unless you're a computer expert, which isn't in your file. It irked Tracy that he'd been given access to her 203 file while she hadn't been allowed to see his. Number two, we're allies. Israel and the U.S. have a special friendship that dates back more than 50 years. With friends like these, X muttered. Last time I checked, espionage was still a capital offense, said Tracy. But Harry, emboldened, put down his hands. This is getting boring, he said smugly. Either shoot me or let me file my report. How about neither of the above, Tracy shot back. We go forward with the mission, and when it's complete and we're back in Washington, then Uncle Sam will decide if you get to report back to your boss in Tel Aviv or go to prison. Yeah, maybe you'll end up sharing a cell with Jackson Pollock, X added, crossing his arms. That's Jonathan Pollard, moron. Jackson Pollock is the artist. Right. Well, both of you are drips, X said, the best comeback he could muster. Fine. I accept the terms of the agreement. May I have my laptop back, please? It's not an agreement. It's an order, Tracy said. She gestured to X. And he'll hold on to the laptop until I say so. X took the laptop. And be sure to wash your hands, Harry, he said. X and Tracy turned to go and received an unpleasant surprise when they bumped into a sar coming around the corner. How much did he hear? X wondered. You cannot fool me any longer, a sar announced. I know exactly what's going on. Harry tensed. Out of the corner of his eye, X could see him positioning himself for an attack. 
He remembered how swiftly the Israeli agent had snapped that bandit's neck. The thought of that happening to Hassar dismayed him. Tracy was already reaching for her holster. X stepped between them and the team. Oh, really? the identity thief said, his voice betraying nothing but amusement. And what is that, my friend? The two of you have been quarreling over the woman. The two men traded glances, then in unison nodded sheepishly. The youth lectured them. I know it is natural for us to be attracted to one who is so beautiful and brave and virtuous as this, but we cannot let emotions harm our cause. Recall the proverb, Love makes a man both blind and deaf. Harry's body relaxed. X ruffled Asar's hair yet again. Don't worry about the two of us, he said. We have no intention of killing one another. Yet. They say sometimes even the intestine and the stomach disagree. Lying on her tummy on Coca Cabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro, flaunting her slim-down tush in a thong, Samantha Adamson was updating her Facebook page. Well, not hers exactly, but a creation of hers named Cassandra. Unlike Samantha, Cassandra had always been slim and sexy, and had been a cheerleader in high school as well as homecoming queen. She worked as a consultant and had a pet terrier. Sam was almost broke now, having burned through the hundred thousand dollars in cash she managed to flee the apartment with. Trying to access the nest egg in the Caymans with all this federal heat would be foolhardy. But she was content. She'd found a kid who was handy with electronics to make a gadget to attach to gas station card readers and ATMs for skimming. When a user swiped their debit or credit card, her own reader would snatch banking information off the magnetic strip. It was a route she and her former partner had been using just before the Ali Nazir fiasco. One of X's brainstorms was to extend the concept to the airport kiosks you use for getting boarding passes. She was hoping to try the idea out at Rio's main airport. Technically, it would present little problem. The thing was working up the nerve to plant the scanner in an area teeming with cameras and airport police. In theory, it would be easy to appear to fumble with her credit card at the kiosk to cover the placement, but in practice it would be tricky. It would be a few months before all the details were worked out and money would start rolling in. Yet her heart was content, thanks to her Brazilian boyfriend, her Aztec prince, as she gushed to her Facebook friends. Off by a thousand miles, but love has poor geography. Santiago was not only a better lover than her ex, he treated her like a queen. Even before she lost weight, he told her she was beautiful. When the Dear Honey Hips email arrived, Sam was stunned to see who it was from, incensed in a way that he had re-entered her world. She knew the writer's true name, or rather thought that she did, but in her mind now he was simply the soulless black hole bad memories from what she dubbed her old fat days, when she frankly hated herself, came rushing back. But when she saw how much money he was offering for a little favor, as he put it, her green eyes brightened, and felt a familiar sensation between her legs, as hot as the Brazilian sand. She looked out at the ocean as Santiago emerged from the sea, a bare-chested Adonis, he flashed his gleaming teeth, and she smiled back. Chapter 19 Down the Rabbit Hole The next morning, Harry and X saddled the donkeys in Fawad's barn. Tracy was over at the well, filling a water bucket for the animals, while Asar chatted with Fawad nearby. The pair embraced, then Asar strolled over to them, an odd smile on his face, that X found disconcerting. Azar, come help us pack the donkeys, said Harry, who seemed not to notice the boy's creepy expression. We need food and water for the rest of our journey. Azar shook his head. There will be no need for that. X and Harry exchanged glances, perplexed. Was he saying this was the end of the road? Had all that stuff about thinking his companions were caught up in a love triangle been a clever ruse? X thought. Does this mean he has blown the whistle on us to Fawad, and we're all about to get shot? 
What do you mean we will not need food or water? X asked. Is the chief's stronghold that close? Asar gave a mischievous grin. The end of your journey is closer than you would ever imagine, boss. Come, follow me. Bring only your weapons and the computer. The men slid their rifles off the donkeys. X loaded the backpack, bearing the laptop on his back. Walk this way, Asar instructed them. What about the woman? Harry asked. Women are forbidden there, Asar told them. When they reached the well, the teen explained that to Tracy. Tracy frowned and told them, My assignment was to escort you safely to the headquarters. Then your mission is at an end, Asar assured her. I will never forget your courage. We will part company then, Tracy said. I will return to Afghanistan and report to my superiors. She bowed to Harry and then to X. It seemed that something more was called for, a hug at least, but X gave Tracy only a salute. I will tell the chief how well you have served the cause, he said. Tracy turned and headed back to Fawad's house. X watched her go, suddenly filled with an ill-defined yearning. The plan called for them to separate, but he'd been accustomed to having her around. As much as he hated to admit it, he would miss her. The men followed Asar to the small mosque at the center of the village. Along the way they passed villagers rolling carts full of grain, a one-legged man hobbling with a cane. The peasants nodded in greeting. The path took them by squealing children playing aquab, a version of tag where it was an eagle and the others pigeons he preyed upon. X was no believer in omens, but to his discomfort he could not help thinking that in the parlance of old-school con artists a pigeon was a mark who was easily fooled. Were the two of them being duped and about to be pounced on? "'Are we going to pray?' Harry asked. But X had an inkling about what they'd meet behind the mosque doors. Inside the modest temple candles were lit, and the walls were full of religious markings swirling wheels within wheels. There were no paintings of Allah or Mohammed. Islam forbids such images as idolatry. That much X knew about the religion. There was no one else around, but a prayer rug lay in place as if any minute a devout Muslim was about to kneel toward Mecca and pray. X and Harry looked around, mystified. Well, Asar challenged them, do you see it? X had a pretty good idea, but he humored Asar and shook his head. The teen knelt and pulled away the prayer rug, revealing a wooden trap door. The Americans have been in this mosque a half dozen times and never found this. X found this a bit surprising. It would have been the first place he looked, but then again hiding money and other items was one of his specialties. After you, my young friend, he told Asar. The three men descended a rickety staircase into blackness. X had by no means overcome his claustrophobia, but this was a good deal better than squeezing through their escape tunnel. For some reason he was reminded of Alice in Wonderland, and he had a feeling the chief's headquarters would be as topsy-turvy a universe as the Mad Hatter's. About eighteen feet down they reached a tunnel. A huge high-intensity flashlight was hanging from a hook and Asar grasped it and flicked it on. The passageway was surprisingly wide, enough to accommodate all three men abreast, although they had to hunch over as they walked. The warriors of Allah carve these tunnels out? Harry asked in wonderment. The caves are natural, but the passages were widened and many of the chambers expanded, Asar explained. Bin Laden himself assisted us. He flew in heavy equipment from his father's construction empire, it is said he drove one of the bulldozers himself. X pictured the legendary master of disaster piloting a bulldozer with a John Deere cap in place of his turban, and found the image so comical, like Eddie Albert manning a tractor in the banker's suit in Green Acres, that he had to choke down a hysterical giggle. They walked nearly a hundred yards before they reached a checkpoint. There, two guards hardly got to their feet and shoved AK-47s in their faces. "'We are servants of the chief,' Asar told them. "'Yes, I recognize you. You are Asar, the chief's old driver. Don't you recognize me, Omar?' 
Asar unslung his rifle and dropped it, then hugged the other man. Still, we need the password, said guard number two. Peace, replied Asar without hesitation. And we must search you, Omar reminded the team somewhat apologetically. Of course. They surrendered their weapons and allowed themselves to be frisked. Then they marched behind Omar down the passageway and entered a cavern. X had imagined something more spectacular. Perhaps it was childish, but he'd literally pictured the bat cave, complete with giant computer mainframes. Still, the complex was extensive. They passed through a warehouse for military supplies, including huge stockpiles of guns and ammunition, bazookas, artillery shells, rocket-propelled grenades, mines, and stolen U.S., Afghan, and Pakistani army uniforms. In another room, caches of water and food were stored. Next, they passed through barracks with pillows and blankets scattered on the ground, and where dozens of men, presumably resting from their duties of killing and maiming, peacefully dozed. We have a state-of-the-art ventilation system and our own hydroelectric generators. Three of them, Omar bragged as if he'd built them himself. They run off an underground river. How many men? Harry asked. Twelve hundred fighters. Twelve hundred and three now, Asar pointed out, and his old friend grinned. After another three hundred yards or so, Omar announced they had reached the offices of the chief. X held his breath. According to Mr. Jones, he and the real Ali Nazir had never met. But the committee had only just discovered that Ali was anything more than a reckless, selfish playboy. Who knew for sure? The chief emerged from behind the door. He was far older than in his file photos Mr. Jones had shared with him. But then X supposed that famous picture on the FBI's most wanted poster must be ten years old. Apparently he decided to age gracefully and not dye his beard like bin Laden. "'Where is my old friend?' the old man demanded when he saw the newcomers. "'Oh, drat, X thought. Busted. But when the chief spotted X, he shuffled hardly over and embraced him in delight, kissing the visitor on both cheeks for good measure. "'You're taller than I recalled,' the chief said. "'But I saw you only from afar at that gathering in Kandahar.' At least eighty, and decked out in what appeared to be pajamas, the chief looked like the grandfather of a 7-Eleven clerk, more than the head hunch of the world's biggest terrorist organization. In the Arab press, he was portrayed as a cross between Batman and Robin Hood. X had not expected someone so frail. Instead of the signature camouflage jacket in which the chief delivered his many video performances, he wore a red bathrobe. He reminded X of Hugh Hefner in his declining years. "'Your escape has been a great propaganda victory,' the chief declared. "'You showed that despite all their millions of dollars in weapons, all their satellites and spies and drones, the infidels can be defeated. He hugged the Tsar, and you brought this brave one, who is like a son, back to me. The chief introduced a tall, gaunt, bespectacled man. The guy held his lips pursed in a manner that reminded X of a spinster librarian in a Little Rascals episode. This is Dr. Zawari, my second-in-command. I have heard many good things about you, X lied, and this is my dear friend Moamar, who aided us in our escape. Dr. Zawari scrutinized them with an intensity that suggested X-ray vision. Many have tried before to escape Abd al-Rahman prison, he observed. It sounds miraculous indeed, almost too good to be true. Harry began to explain. Well, Allah was merciful. The chief waved him away and chuckled. Don't worry. Our sources in the prison confirmed all the details reported by Al Jazeera. Forgive my aid. Dr. Zawari was in the camp of El Safadi when the man was murdered by assassins posing as journalists. Having been bitten by a snake, he is afraid of a rope. I remember that incident well and understand, nodded X, 
who had no idea what the old man was talking about. We must all be on our guard against deception. Dr. Zawari, please escort Assar to the dormitory and Mormart to the guest quarters, said the chief. Come, walk with me, Ali. X wouldn't have minded going to the guest quarters, too, but he obligingly accompanied the tottering terrorist bigwig into his office suite, noticing for the first time that the chief wore fluffy bedroom slippers. In the first of three rooms was a large table on which was laid out a huge topographic map of Afghanistan. Dozens of pushpins, every color of the rainbow, dotted the military map, representing, X assumed, where the chief's forces and those of his adversaries were stationed. X had only seen something like it in World War II movies. I suppose if I was one of those spies with total recall, I could commit it to memory, he mused. Ushered into the next room, X beheld a small greenhouse lit by fluorescence. The identity thief inhaled the fragrances of dozens of unfamiliar flowers. This greenhouse is my pride and joy, the chief said. We grow many exotic plants here, some that the London Botanical Gardens would have cause to envy. Here, look at my blue forsythias. They are beautiful. What an accomplishment to cultivate such a garden underground, X marveled. But he was thinking a nine-foot-tall man-eating Venus flytrap would suit you better. You're like a James Bond villain, but senile. The next door led to the terrorist leader's private study. There was a photo of the chief posing arm in arm with his underling, Bin Laden, and another between a pair of prominent Iranian mullahs. On his large, ornate mahogany desk, a TV was tuned to Fox News, where an anchor was feverishly updating the public on the details of a celebrity's shoplifting trial. His shelves boasted an impressive collection of books, perhaps two hundred, and the variety surprised X tomes on gardening, architecture, anatomy, biblical archaeology, even home decor. It is as I have heard. You are truly a Renaissance man, X said. The chief beamed at that. Phew, he thought. Wasn't sure the Renaissance was a good thing to you folks. Thought maybe the Dark Ages was more up your alley. The terrorist leader proudly pointed to a row of six tomes, set aside from the others on their own shelf. Those are the ones I have written. X examined the titles. Poems for a New Afghanistan was the name of one collection. I Sing of Freedom was another. Thought the identity thief, you have to give the old coot credit for being upbeat. The old man took the book from X and thumbed through it until he reached a page bookmarked with the news clipping about a UN bombing in Libya. He handed the book back to Ali Nazir, gesturing with seeming diffidence that he should read it. The American, who was still more adept at speaking Arabic than reading it, recited slowly, My love for you is like a cloud from heaven that makes the desert bloom. Your fragrance is like a mixture of lavender and honey, and your touch is as pure as raindrops that tap upon my skin. It went on in that vein for another forty stanzas. A love poem, X was startled to realize. Are you familiar with the works of Jahal al-Din Muhammad Balki? His host inquired. Well, I have read a few of his works. The identity thief lied through his teeth. He is my model, though, of course, my words are like the scribblings of a child next to such a master. I hope that years in the future your books will sit on a shelf next to it, X said. You are gracious, but it is only a hobby, the old man said, returning the book to the shelf. We hold Mushara competitions every Tuesday night. You are welcome to participate. You can get pen and ink from my secretary. You are most gracious, chief. Great 
poetry slam with a bunch of Islamo-fascist lunatics, X thought. Well, that should be entertaining. What's Wednesday's activity? Twister? The chief guided him to a small desk in the corner on which a yellow legal pad rested. This is what I am working on now. I would be honored if you would take a look at it. The simplicity of the language threw X a curveball, but by the bottom of the first page it became clear what he was looking at. Is this? Yes. A children's book, the chief said with some excitement. My first. Skimming the text and the attendant stick figure illustrations, X quickly gleaned that the villain was a Jewish golem who preyed upon the people of a village and ate them. The village children defeat the monster by pelting him with magic stones. It is an allegory, he said. Very perceptive, smiled the chief, clapping him on the back. It instructs our children about the wickedness of the Zionists at an early age. Forgive my primitive artwork. I will, of course, hire a professional illustrator. Okay, that's just about enough bonding for one day, X felt. Now it's time for the setup. I bring a warning, X told the chief. The Americans have used all their means to seize some of my assets in the Caymans. I have had to transfer all that remains to a hiding place. The chief frowned and nodded sympathetically. I am concerned that they may use their cunning to go after the assets of the Warriors of Allah as well, X continued. The CIA hacked into our computers to locate our funds and could easily do the same to you. The chief chuckled. You have no reason to worry, my son. These walls are shielded by many feet of rock, and we have sophisticated security safeguards and firewalls. Our assets are safe. X frowned dubiously. Well, that is welcome news, but always keep in mind the proverb, you cannot store milk in a sieve and complain of bad luck. The chief laughed. That is true, my brother, very true. It is my suggestion that you convert your funds to gold bullion so that the enemies of Islam cannot seize them with the touch of a button. Hide the goal where the Americans cannot find it. My organization has a facility in Uzbekistan where you could safely store it. The terror boss stroked his beard thoughtfully. That is one possibility. Tell me, where is it that you have moved your own funds? X shook his head. I am sorry, my honored friend. Even to you I cannot divulge that information. The chief looked a little taken aback. Then he nodded. I understand. Do not fret. You are my brother, whom I trust and love. He hugged X. After what X found to be an awkwardly long embrace, the old man released him. X pointed to the rock walls. How do you communicate with your followers, with all the shielding in the rocks? Surely cell phones do not work down here. The chief opened what appeared to be a cigar box on his desk and showed him a phone plugged into a charger. It communicates with a relay box that is hardwired to an antenna outside, he explained. The signal bounces off four satellites so the Americans cannot trace it. Or something like that. I am not sure of the technical details. The point is that it allows me to communicate with my commanders in the field. One of my aides got the idea from a spy novel. Now, I have a surprise for you. As noted earlier, X was not fond of surprises, and under these circumstances especially so. What other hobbies did this demented old murderer have? Watercolored, perhaps, or crochet? Perhaps he was about to be invited to a friendly game of battleships. Your brother-in-law is here, the chief said, beaming. I have heard that the two of you have had many grand adventures together. X felt his heart skip a beat. What? In the cave complex? In the country. He will be here tomorrow. So soon. X resisted the urge to gulp. Truly, that is wonderful news, chief. 
the pace of their mission would have to be accelerated. A lot. X and Harry had been given a private room, a stone's thrown from the chief's office, a considerable honor they were given to understand, while a sar bumped in dormitory number three. When X told the Israeli spy about the imminent arrival of Ali Nazir's brother-in-law, Hassim bin Alil, he became anxious. "'You need to convince the chief to transfer those funds,' he demanded. "'You can't push a mark too hard, or he'll back off. Mark!' "'Stop thinking like a goddamn thief and start thinking like a spy,' Harry fumed. "'Stop thinking like a spy and start thinking like a thief,' X retorted. "'Because that's what we're doing. Stealing stuff. "'So what's your plan? I'm working on that. "'And what about the laptop? I need it.' X took it out of the backpack and held it in front of the Israeli, who sat on one of the two beds. You won't be able to get a signal out of here, so there's no harm you can do. Harm I can do? Just keep it under the bed, X told him. I want to be able to check it and keep tabs on you. Make sure you're not up to something outside the mission. Harry fumed. Me up to something? I'm not the criminal. You're not getting the laptop till you agree. Fine, snarled Moamar and yanked the computer out of X's hand. 